Having discussed legacy in general in part one of uh, this module, we now turn to some specific cases of positive and problematic legacies from World's Fairs. So there are many types of legacies that World's Fairs leave behind. Uh, some of them are well-known landmarks, uh, most famous perhaps the Eiffel Tower, the Unisphere in New York, the Atomium in Brussels, uh, landmarks like the Space Needle in Seattle. Uh, these are significant attractions, sometimes icons, that tourists and residents recognize as being part of their city once the fair ends. There are also public spaces and parks like Flushing Meadows, New York, a Brew Park in Brussels, Balboa Park in San Diego, and Jackson Park in Chicago. Another legacy can be new venues. The arena in Shanghai left after Expo 2010, or the public offices that occupied some of the buildings constructed for Expo 98 in Lisbon. Here's one example of legacy, and often legacies today are not recognized as being associated with a World's Fair. In this case, this is the Museum of Science and Industry, which is the only substantial remainder from the Chicago Fair of 1893. This was originally the Field Museum, which then moved, uh, and the Museum of Science and Industry now occupies the space. So a significant landmark widely recognized in Chicago, but perhaps not fully understood as being a legacy of a World's Fair. In uh, San Francisco, the World's Fair in 1915 created the Palace of Fine Arts. This is also highly recognized as being a feature of the San Francisco landscape. Of interest is the fact that when it was built, it was only designed to be temporary, and it was just plaster over a frame and then painted. But it became such a popular element of the landscape that it was eventually constructed as it was meant to look, and now is a long-standing feature of the city. The 1929 World's Fair in Barcelona produced many grand buildings uh, that now have been turned to other uses. There's public spaces, fountains. Uh, the large building here is the National Museum, which is a highly rated attraction for visitors to the city. Also in Barcelona, again, public space, the towers and fountains of the 1929 World's Fair. Uh, the architectural heritage, which was rebuilt for the World's Fair, this is the German pavilion from 1929, that was rebuilt 30 years ago uh, and occupies a space in, in the parkland next to the World's Fair site. The World's Fair in Brussels in 1958 with the Atomium, which continues to be a widely recognized tourist attraction, as well as the parkland that surrounds the Atomium. After Expo 88 in Brisbane in Australia, uh, there were uh, several attempts to use the land and one of the productive choices was to create a public beach that is right across from the city centre. Uh, Lisbon, Portugal in 1998 uh, rebuilt its riverside and now allows access to the river, which was not possible in the past because it was occupied with um, unused industrial buildings and space. Now this is the Shanghai 2010 World's Fair while it was operating, many buildings and structures. Now these are removed, but some buildings are chosen to remain. Uh, in the case of Shanghai, the legacy was the arena uh, and also the China Pavilion, which now serves as an art museum. But the area also contains considerable public space cleared through the completion of the World's Fair, as sometimes the land is used for open space and other times reserved for larger construction to come in the future. But there are also some challenges when it comes to legacy. Uh, often cities find that after the event, they don't really have concrete plans or the plans they thought would be workable are no longer feasible. 
One reason this occurs is that often plans are made when the expo is designed, and so the plans could be 10 years or even longer in age, and so need to be revisited. Another institutional element is that there is often a team involved that produces and completes the expo and then moves on to other mega events or roles. And then a new team is given responsibility for the legacy. Legacy is often seen as an afterthought and it's not seen as being part of a longer term process that includes hosting an event, but continuing on to provide new space and benefits to the residents of the host city. Uh, one challenge was Expo 82 held in Knoxville, Tennessee in the United States. Uh, some of the space is open and used by the public, but there have been continuing challenges about some of the legacy areas finding a viable use. Uh, one icon is the uh, Sun Sphere, which remains uh, as an easily recognized icon. But even that tower has had years when it has not been open to the public or accessible because of a, a lack of interest or resources. This is Expo 2012 in Yosu, Korea. And this was, uh, again, an image of a, a vibrant fair while it was underway. But a year later, as we see the grounds, um, most of it is in fact closed. Uh, the public can still gain access to some of the sites, but there's not much there to see. And hopes that the facilities would become a shopping mall uh, have not really borne fruit, uh, in part because of changing economic conditions. And so the legacy of the fair in some ways is this large structure that the small city of Yosu now needs to come to terms with, both in terms of future use and also in terms of the, the maintenance and carrying cost of such a large centre. So Expo 2015 in Milan has a number of legacies. Now, all national pavilions must be removed as part of the agreement for participating, although the organizers may choose to request some if they are of particular interest. And the organizers may have built some of the major pavilions to remain as a feature of the site or to be converted to other uses. There's the tangible legacy of the fair, which includes the upgraded space, which is next to the Milan Trade Fair grounds. Uh, the creation of Expo as a testbed for a smart city initiative for Milan in the future. So a chance to pilot test new ideas around technology. And also substantial developments around greenways, a green space, and the waterways of Milan, uh, both for the better environmental management of the city and also to create new recreation areas. There are intangible legacies as well for Milan, including the Milan Charter, which was a statement of the right to food to be signed by many countries, uh, the greater visibility of the city, the skill sets gained by its residents as they developed new skills for the World's Fair, and also sustainability practices that carry on from the creation of the fairgrounds and the theme of the fair itself. So Expo 2015 also has some challenges. Uh, we have the public cost of 1.35 billion euros, and we always need to look at this in terms of the opportunity cost. Could this money have been used for something else? Is there a better investment target for public funds for the city of Milan? The expo was planned at a time of strong growth, but the legacy must be fulfilled at a time of slow economic growth. So ambitious plans that seemed viable in the past may no longer be the case because of economic conditions. Uh, Milan already has trade and display space, so the fact that new spaces have been created may not contribute greatly to the role that trade plays for the city. The expectation was that developers would be interested in the extensive and renewed Expo site, but last year no developers came forward to bid on the legacy site. So the site at the moment does not have a clear plan, nor does it have a champion or owner who wants to develop the site into something new. 
So world's fairs can provide uh, tremendous opportunities to advance the city, to provide opportunities for the residents, and to provide global visibility. The world's fair is a platform for the host city to use as it wishes to advance its interests. The challenge though is how to direct spending to support the future vision of the city. The end result is not just the event itself. The end result is a better city that can be enjoyed by all its residents. So we see mega events really as a means to an end. They are a way to build a better city for the host residents. Now, in conclusion, I wish to thank uh, the, the many people who have been involved in our mega event series that uh, we will continue to offer through Michigan State University. Uh, first, MSU Global and the staff at MSU Global who have been essential to facilitating the production and presentation of our work. Um, Jerry Reed, Rashad Muhammad, and Teal and Thor Schaefer have all played essential roles in turning academic ideas into public information. We also want to recognize the School of Planning, Design and Construction, and in particular, the Mega Event Planning Group, which we comprise, which can be accessed online at megaeventplanning.org, and also the Mega Event website, which is more of a public website whereas the Mega Event Planning Group is more of an academic website. And you can visit us for mega events in general at megaevents.world. We also want to acknowledge the important role of MSU libraries in providing information and assistance in the production of this online offering. Finally, we will be offering an expanded online course on World's Fairs in fall 2015 and we'll be returning with a MOOC in 2016 on the Rio Olympics. Thank you very much.